Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, the only show on the internet that feeds your need for history. Coming up on this week's show, I sit down with philosopher, author and broadcaster AC Grayling. We get exclusive access to actual artefacts from a 19th century riot. And I continue my epic hike through history along Pilgrim's Way. First up, the news. Archaeologists in Brazil have uncovered hundreds of earthworks built in the Amazon. The findings provide evidence of how indigenous people lived in the region before Europeans arrived. And the Ashmolean Museum has raised the £1.35 million required to purchase the hoard of King Alfred the Great. The Wattlington hoard was discovered in Oxfordshire in 2015. And the face of Orkney's St Magnus has been reconstructed by a forensic artist. Hugh Morrison's research included study of 1920s photographs of the saint's bones. Magnus was martyred around 11.15. Hi, I'm Susanna Lipscomb and you're watching Viral History. Now, he's been a regular contributor to The Times and The Guardian newspapers and has written on everything from atheism to the attack on civil liberties. But recently Viral History had great pleasure in talking to Professor AC Grayling about the Age of Enlightenment. AC Grayling, uh, great pleasure to talk to you uh, for Viral History. Your book The Age of Genius is about the 17th century um, intellectual revolution, a time when people stopped looking to God for answers and started asking those same questions of science. Do you think this was because of or despite the tumultuous times that people were living in? In fact, a bit of both, really. Um, the run-up to the 17th century intellectual revolution is, of course, the background of the uh, Reformation in the 16th century. And um, what that effectively did was to divide Europe into a domain where the church, now the Roman Catholic Church, still exercised a tremendous degree of control over what people were allowed to think, what they were allowed to learn, what they were allowed to say. Whereas in the Protestant parts of Europe, there, there was no comparable control. And so there was a great efflorescence, a great outburst, really, of um, thinking about alchemy and magic and the Kabbalah and Hermeticism. And it was out of this uh, you know, tumult of, of inquiry and discussion that some people in the early 17th century, and two principal figures in particular, uh, Descartes and Francis Bacon, recognized that in order to separate the wheat from the chaff here, to separate out chemistry from alchemy, astronomy from astrology, medicine from magic, what they had to do was they had to find the right kind of method. So one of the key moments in the intellectual revolution really is the um, thinking that went on about how you conduct inquiry. Bacon was very, very significant here because, of course, he argued that the empirical approach, observation and the application of reason was cited as an inspiration by the founders of the Royal Society of London and when they got their Royal Charter in 1662. And, you know, he said, not merely uh, is it a case of looking at nature, but go to the people who deal with nature. Go to the farmers and the, and the carpenters and the miners and the shipwrights and ask them about how matter, material things, behave when, as he put it, they're being vexed. So you learn a great deal about the world from observation, and that was the key uh, aspect of the empirical method that he urged. Did the struggle between science and religion define that period? And if it's still ongoing, what's happened in between? Yes, the struggle between science and religion was a, a key issue at the time. And um, one has to remember that uh, Giordano Bruno, uh, Cesare Venini um, were burned at the stake in the early years of the, of the 17th century because they had publicly avowed their belief that the Copernican view of the universe was correct. Um, Galileo's trial in the early 1630s in Rome, where he had to recant his view that the earth moves and flies around the sun, was actually the last throw of the dice from the point of view of the church's effort to hold the line against the advance of science by force. But uh, as you know, um, it was only acknowledged by uh, the church, by the Vatican, in the 1990s that they had wronged Galileo. And the um, uh, view that 
was being contested in the 17th century by scientists that the Earth is at the centre of the universe, that the universe is very young, uh, that uh, you know, the religious view about the nature and destiny of man in the universe is the correct one. That view was the one that was being effectively challenged in the 17th century. So even though today the great majority of people still think as people thought before the 17th century, nevertheless, whereas their view was the dominant view before that time, it is now from a functional point of view, not from a numbers point of view, but from a functional point of view, it is the marginal view, the minority view. Because our world is now a world of laptops and aeroplanes and technology and the rest, which of course came out of the scientific revolution. And during this time, how dangerous was it to admit your atheism? I think it remained uh, dangerous to avow atheism uh, right up until the second half of the 19th century. Dangerous because in the uh, 16th and early 17th century you could be put to death for it. Uh, dangerous until the second half of the 19th century because you could be subjected to social exclusion and uh, you know, being sent to Coventry, being blocked from taking any active part really in the, in the life of society because it was regarded with particular horror. In the 18th century, there were plenty of people who were actually atheists, but they described themselves as deists, either to sort of cover their tracks a bit or because, until the 19th and 20th centuries, the great puzzle about origins, where did the universe come from, how did it get started, where did life come from, how did it get started, there were just no possible answers to those questions. Neither cosmology nor physics nor um, the biological sciences had begun to suggest answers. And so people thought there might have been some agency that got things going, and then that agency disappeared or lost interest or something. That was the deistic view of people like Voltaire and many others. But in practice, they were atheists. Professor Grayling, thank you so much. Ah, the edge of genius. There's no better guide through that era of ideas than AC Grayling. Now up next on Viral History, our roving reporter Gemma Chandler uncovers some artefacts from one of the worst riots of the 19th century in this week's Material Evidence. Hi, I'm Gemma Chandler and this week we're at the Galleries of Justice Museum in Nottingham to look at some fascinating objects in the storerooms here. And I'm joined by Bev, who's the senior curator here at the museum and she's going to talk us through these fascinating things. So these two items actually relate to the Reform Bill riots of 1831. And we have the broadside and we've also got a truncheon. Now the Reform Bill riots took place in October 1831 as basically a protest against the fact that working class men were not given the right to vote. So the local men actually went on a riot and destroyed a number of properties including the castle, a silk mill out in Beeston and Colic Hall. So obviously the protesters were rounded up, arrested and then actually brought to the cells here at the county jail which the museum occupies now and were then obviously subsequently tried in the following year, found guilty and the majority were actually sentenced to transportation to Australia but there were three very unfortunate men who were actually sentenced to execution. So this broadside here actually takes you through the, their story, their actual trial, their confessions and their last letters to their loved ones. So you've got the gentlemen of Hearson, Beck and Armstrong. So all three of those were actually executed on this site on the front steps of the museum that you see today. So it's quite a harrowing item and quite a harrowing story actually because this is about men wanting the right to vote. So obviously it's, it's quite pertinent. Um, come 1918 you also have women suddenly wanting the right to vote as well. So come 2018 we'll be celebrating that anniversary. So these are quite significant objects. So what do we know about these broadsheets and who produced them and how were they distributed? So the most broadsides were actually printed and made by local printers on very cheap paper and normally sold for a penny. So quite a cheap thing to purchase. And they would be sold on the actual day of the execution. And they'd have quite a large crowd to sell to. Mm. So you could have anything from a thousand to several thousand people coming to an execution. And obviously there was quite a lot of people interested in this because they felt that the wrong people were being executed, that these men should not have been executed for mm. their right to vote. Um, so these would have then been bought by family members, anybody who actually came and watched the execution as a bit of a memento, in a sense, to sort of keep that story alive. 
Um, so not everybody would have been quite that particularly literate in the Victorian period and early uh, late Georgian period, but you'd have somebody that you'd know in your local community who would actually then read this out to the wider community. So this was a truncheon that was actually used during the riots? So you'd have local constables, special constables. You also had the militia rounding up the rioters as well. Um, so, so yes, so this is what the police and special constables would have been armed with during this period in history. Well, thank you, Bev, for talking us through such an interesting item. I certainly wouldn't want to be bopped on the head by that. Uh, join us next week for some more fascinating items. I wouldn't like to be bopped on the head by that either. <laughs> Softly, softly policing in those days. <laughs> now, we should say that the Galleries of Justice Museum will be reopening next month as the National Justice Museum. We wish them the best of luck with their relaunch. So last week I got as far as Dartford on my long distance walk retracing the steps of medieval pilgrims. This week I take in a Tudor palace and get to meet some modern day friars in part three of Pilgrim's Way. Day two and I head southeast out of Dartford and back in time through the ancient landscape of Kent. I meet up with writer Derek Bright, an expert guide along Pilgrim's Way. One of the things I've brought to show you is a, an ampulla. This is a lead ampulla. This one dates back to about 1450, I'm told. Um, it's got very fine scallop shell carving there that can just be made out on that side and it would have had two rings here where it would have been hung by a necklace. So this was a key souvenir that pilgrims would have picked up once they reached Canterbury. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, the monks would have done with the ampulla is they would have filled it with the blood and even some of the brains of Becket. Uh, and we know from accounts that the monks at Canterbury kept a lead cistern uh, with this gory mixture in uh, and it was topped up with water for probably about 200 years uh, and red ochre was added to it to give it an authentic colour and that would have been sold to pilgrims and they would have filled their ampullae uh, and then they would have hung this round their neck and this would have denoted to other travellers on their return that they were genuine pilgrims. This is a scallop shell. Uh, scallop shells have long been associated with pilgrimage and the patron saint of pilgrimage, St. James of uh, Santiago de Compostela. And it would denote that they're pilgrims on their pilgrimage. Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, had feuded with his former friend, King Henry II, over the power of the church. And on the 29th of December, 1170, Becket was brutally murdered by four knights inside Canterbury Cathedral. They believed their king, Henry II, had wanted the turbulent Thomas dead. My day ends at the medieval friary at Aylesford, a fitting place to stay on this epic historical journey. That friary looked amazing. Yes, and spans almost 800 years of history. That's almost as much history as Margarita's across. of February. When asked how he found America today in 1964, Beatle, John Lennon, replied, it's easy, you turn left at Greenland. It's nearly time for us to go. But we'll drop by again next Thursday. Don't forget to follow Viral History on Facebook and Twitter, like this video and subscribe to our channel. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you next week.